Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome. Thank you for attending tonight's webinar presentation. My name is Luke Boyd. I am the Director of Education and Public Programs here at Historic Richmond Town on Staten Island. Uh, the subject of our program tonight is the Revolutionary War in Staten Island. Uh, this is part of a series of programs called Historic Richmond Town Talks, a series of webinars that we launched a few months ago uh, in the summer uh, in the midst of the pandemic as a way to engage our virtual visitors here in the borough, but of course across, uh, across the country. Uh, I'm very excited for tonight's program. It's been long in the development and we have a stellar uh, panel to help us understand this uh, history better. Uh, the story of the American Revolution is at the core of our national idea and our national identity. The concepts of self-governance, independent political thinking, popular sovereignty, ideas of the Age of Enlightenment motivated many in the 13 American colonies to seek independence from Great Britain, and that thinking influences our politics today. There are moments and momentous individuals that come to mind at the thought of this period. The battles of Lexington and Concord in 1775, the dramatic signing of the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776, George Washington's night crossing of the Delaware River, the Battle of Yorktown. These pivotal moments were precipitated by years of political unrest in the 13 colonies and animated a war that lasted nearly seven years and claimed more than 6,000 American lives. In popular memory, the Revolutionary War is prone to myth. Militia and Minutemen emerge as superheroic figures representing an ideal of duty and a representation of white manhood. Images of Washington, Lafayette, and founding fathers in the Continental Congresses echo throughout our history in story and song, but also in film and, of course, even on the Broadway stage. There is much left unsaid about the individual soldier, enslaved Africans caught up in the conflict, and the civilian who faced hardship, just to name a few. And the goal tonight is to advance that ball a little bit in that direction of broadening that history. Much of this, though, is due to the nature of the historical record, which leaves out many voices and privileges others. And the traditional historical treatment of this subject has also been a part of this story. Some of the folks on the call tonight are part of that new wave of scholarship, uh, looking at the American Revolution again with a fresh perspective. But what does this all have to do with Staten Island? Staten Island was not the theater of a major engagement or battle, but it does have its own claim to this history. As the Continental Congress signed the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776, the British Army began its occupation of Staten Island. They would remain for seven years until the war's end in 1783. But traces of this history remain across this borough's landscape. And I have a few photographs that I can share uh, that help us understand some of the buildings across Staten Island, the landmarks, some of which are owned and operated and preserved by Historic Richmond Town and some of our friends and neighbors. The first is the Perrine House, seen here in this photograph and this picture of the plaque nearby. This is right on Richmond Road. This house was built in 1663 by Pierre Below, who was part of the Dutch settlement of Staten Island. Uh, the, the house stayed in the family for generations and when Thomas Stilwell was the man of the house who married one of the women of the family, uh, he was part of the English political system that during this period he served as a constable, sheriff, a magistrate, and a member of the colonial assembly. During the American Revolution, when Anne Perrine lived in the house with her seven children, British troops occupied the property and reportedly caused damage to the site by cutting down a tremendous number of trees. After the war ended, Anne, a widow of a loyalist, attempted to get reparations from the British government. And a copy of her claim letter is preserved in the archives at Historic Richmond Town, an incredible record. Um, also in the archives is uh, a copy of Anne's will, which notes that in, um, in the early 1800s or 1806 when she died, that there were enslaved people on this property by the names of Peter, Phoebe, and Mike, all that is left of uh, of them in the record as their first names. This is one of the oldest houses in New York State 
and you can almost miss it when you're driving along Richmond Road or taking the bus. But it is an incredible link to the story of Staten Island going back to the Dutch settlement, but also to the revolutionary period. This is an example of a loyalist home, people who were loyal to the British empire, the British crown as it were, as opposed to those who were sympathetic with the cause of American independence. This is an amazing photo that's from our collection. This is from 1932. So this is a group of people, now I should say, the Perrine House was the center for the organization that became the Staten Island Historical Society. This was the headquarters of the earliest historic Richmond town that there ever was. And so what we see here is historians gathering in period costume, and they are uh, recreating a, a, a colonial scene celebrating George Washington's bicentennial, his 200th birthday. I believe the gentleman on the horse in the back is supposed to be Paul Revere. So there's a great history of uh, reenactment and living history within these sites as well. One of our neighbors down the street is the Church of St. Andrew. This is an Episcopal church in the heart of Richmond Town neighborhood. Uh, the church was chartered, of course, by Queen Anne in Great Britain in 1713, when it was the Church of England, the Anglican Church, to which it was connected. And this faith community was part of the Church of England, so they were largely loyal to the cause of, uh, of maintaining connection to, uh, to Great Britain. Some of the skirmishes and raids that took place on Staten Island in which continental forces, American forces came to Staten Island to repel the British or to disrupt their operations happened in the areas surrounding Richmond Town and nearby the Church of St. Andrew. The structure that was on this site before, which was damaged years later and destroyed, uh, reportedly was shot at and was used as a hospital for British for, for uh, British soldiers. So it too has an interesting link, uh, but sort of a, a double-sided coin of the nature of uh, loyalty, rebellion, certainly the subject of uh, one of our speaker's films. Going back to historic Richmond Town, this is a picture of the Christopher House, one of the, one of the many beloved structures on our property. The Christopher House was built in the Willowbrook neighborhood of Staten Island in around 1720, the first section 1720. Other sections would be added um, years later. Joseph Christopher, who owned the house during the American Revolution, was reportedly a member of the Committee of Safety, part of the network of uh, citizen patriots who corresponded, who sent information, who were tracking the situation on the ground, as it were, and reporting back to the Continental Congress and other governing bodies. It is believed that secret meetings of the Committee of Safety, the local committee, were held in this very house. It was moved to Staten Island, I'm sorry, moved to Richmond Town, across Staten Island, in the 1960s, just in time for the American Bicentennial. And the last stop on my quick and dirty virtual tour is the Conference House, which I'm sure many of us know very well. Um, the Conference House uh, is in the lower section of Staten Island in Tottenville. Uh, and it was, it was built by a wealthy uh, English immigrant. Uh, in 1776, while the ink on the declaration was still drying, as it were, uh, a peace conference was held in this house. Um, and it was hoped, the hope was that this coming conflict could be avoided. People who attended this conference were Edward Rutledge, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Lord Howe. And I have a feeling Lord Howe is still around, at least his memory, in some way. Um, so some of these structures are operated by Richmond Town, some are not, but it gives you a sense of the built environment and the way we remember the Revolutionary War in our special borough. Um, tonight, we are joined by some very, very special guests who can help us better understand this history, and I'd like to introduce them now. Uh, the first I'll introduce is Dr. Philip Pappas. Uh, Dr. Philip Pappas is Senior Professor of History at Union County College, where he teaches U.S. History, Government, and Economics. He earned his B.A. and his M.A. from Hunter College, CUNY, his M.Phil in History and Ph.D. in History at the Graduate Center at the Univers City University of New York, also part of the CUNY system. In addition to journal and newspaper articles, book reviews, and blog posts, Dr. Pappas has authored That Ever-Loyal Island, Staten Island, and the American Revolution, and Renegade Revolutionary, The Life of General Charles Lee, 
which earned several awards, and he also co-authored Port Richmond. He has also been featured in the documentary film, Loyalty and Rebellion, directed by another panelist, James Verdi, which was inspired by his book, That Ever Loyal Island. Dr. Philip Pappas, thank you for joining us. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here uh, today. Um, thank you, Luke. Uh, I want to thank everybody at Richmond Town uh, for uh, organizing uh, this, um, this event tonight um, on a very important topic. Um, and um, it's, I'm glad to be part of a, a, of a Richmond Town event. Uh, Richmond, I, have, uh, I have a soft spot for Richmond Town in my heart. Uh, and um, I'm glad to be a part of uh, this conversation this evening. Thank you. We are so glad to have you here. Thank you, Dr. Pappas. Um, our next, uh, the next person I'll introduce is James Verdi. James Verdi is a native of Staten Island, New York, with a passion for filmmaking and for history. James's films have been shown at multiple film festivals in the New York City area, with his film The Sagine Mansion winning Best Cinematography Award at the 2018 CUNY Film Festival. His short film, The Boneyard, takes a look at the remnants of ships hidden along the Arthur Kill, the Staten Island Ship Graveyard, which, as you know from our webinar last month on the subject, is a very special topic, and I'm happy to explore that more with you, James, in the future. James's latest film, Loyalty and Rebellion, explores the American Revolutionary War on Staten Island. Most recently, James was nominated for the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Emmy Award. James graduated from Hunter College with a major in political science. James Verdi, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Lou, thank you for having me. I want to thank Richmond Town, thank you as well. And thank you everybody for joining. I think it's going to be a, a fun discussion on, as Phil mentioned, a very you know important topic and, and one that maybe doesn't get enough uh, uh, talk. So I look forward to uh, speaking with everybody and um, having a good discussion. Thank you so much. And last but not least, the gentleman who's been standing the entire time, Mr. Michael Grillo. Michael Grillo is a living historian and museum professional. Michael has been a part of several reenactor units, including the 42nd Regiment of Foot and the 2nd New York Regiment. Now the savvy listeners at home may know those two units interpret different sides of the revolutionary story. So both Redcoat, as it were, and Continental or American sort of uh, adjacent. Uh, Grillo has worked closely with the Brigade of the American Revolution and staff at Colonial Williamsburg to understand better how to make his own costumes, or kits, as we might say in the living history biz. To date, Michael has 24 different uniforms and has portrayed Sir General Thomas Gage, Lord Howe, and of course, George Washington. Michael has been a museum educator at Van Cortlandt House Museum for nearly 20 years, and so Michael, Grillo, I am very pleased to have you, and thank you for joining us. And who are you wearing? Oh, hold on. Hold on, Michael, we lost your audio. If you can turn your microphone on. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Good, perfect. Uh, I'm dressed as Admiral Lord Howe. Uh, I created this, uh, this uniform, I guess, originally for 2001 when we were celebrating the 225th. Of course, you know what happened down at the World Trade Center site, so that was canceled. But I've been there every year since 1999, uh, portraying a British admiral, one of the many uh, sides that I like to portray, whether it's American, whether it's British. Uh, Anything 18th century, anything uh, American Revolution, it's been uh, a love of mine. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really, really taken by the realism in which you present uh, your costume tonight. It's fantastic. The first time I saw, uh, Michael, you perform was at Federal Hall when you were uh, slated to reenact the inauguration of George Washington. Uh, in Federal Hall. It was really exciting and it was just a wonderful thing. So I'm very glad this is coming full circle to have you reporting digitally to historic Richmond Town from points north. My pleasure. Okay, this is quite a glittering assemblage and I'm very excited to get started. Um, so I have some questions for the group and we're going to offer some questions that I've drafted up and that we've talked about. And But if anyone has any questions among the audience, you are free to drop a question into the chat and I will do my best to take a look 
and I will uh, address questions as they come up. I have the chat refreshed and ready to go. My first question is for Dr. Pappas. Dr. Pappas, in your book, That Ever Loyal Island, you discuss the political tensions that are unique to Staten Island in the 1770s as a civil war happening in the midst of the revolution. Can you explain what you meant by that? Thank you, uh, Luke, for that question. Um, yeah, the, um, you know, when you look at the politics of Staten Island in this period, um, leading up to the war and then um, uh, during the war, um, you find uh, an island, a community that is resisting the colonial resistance movement. Um, the Staten Island, Richmond County was the only county in New York that wasn't represented at the first Continental Congress. Um, Richmond County will um, uh, vehemently um, disobey the Continental Associ uh, Association, which was initiated the you know, non-exportation, non-importation uh, policy of the first Continental Congress. Um, the, uh, our colonial assemblymen, Christopher Billup and Benjamin Seaman, were very much opposed to the Continental Congress and the Provincial Congress, calling them you know, illegal uh, governing bodies. Um, even the Committee of Safety uh, on Staten Island, um, when it was created under pressure uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, the Patriot side the, uh, in, Amer in, uh, in New York, um, they reluctantly put together a Committee of Safety. And then when the Committee of Safety was asked to turn over a list of island residents who were not um, uh, following some of the measures of uh, the Provincial Congress uh, and the Continental Congress, the Committee of Safety dragged its feet on that, on that issue. Um, many uh, New Jersey Patriot Committees put economic sanctions on Staten Island, Woodbridge, uh, uh, Dover, New Jersey, um, they, Elizabethtown. So there, there was a lot of pressure on the Staten Island community to sort of, you know, you know, join the uh, join the movement, and that pressure was resisted. Um, uh, Staten Island was seen as a recalcitrant community um, by the Patriot forces, um, and of course, when when the British arrive on Staten Island, Staten Islanders will will welcome them, um, causing more friction between the Staten Islanders and the, the Patriot forces uh, in in New Jersey. Um, also, when when you when you think about um, you know, if you think about the American Revolution, getting back to the Civil War aspect of it in your question, um, it's, it was really, you know, it was really brother against brother. I mean, it is, it is a war for political independence, but it is, it is also, you know, a, a war for home rule. Uh, and, um, and, you know, families were split just like in the American Civil War. For example, the Mercero family, a very famous patriot family on the island. However, there were Mercero cousins who were loyalists and eventually were exiled uh, to Canada. Um, so it was, there was this sense of brother against brother. Families were split among one of the most famous families that were split, of course, was Benjamin Franklin, uh, his family, right, with uh, his son, William, um, the royal, royal governor of New Jersey. Um, so, um, you know, in, whenever you have that kind of, um, that kind of uh, uh, a war, a civil war, usually there's um, the rules of war sometimes go out the window, um, and it's the most intense fighting. And when you think about guerrilla warfare, when you think about interesting warfare and the American Revolution, we often think about the South, the back country, right? Like depicted in the, the movie, The Patriot, right? The Mel Gibson movie. Um, but that kind of fighting went, went on here around Staten Island, across the Kill Van Cull, across the Arthur Kill, into New Jersey, and then into Staten Island. So um, this, you know, the sense that you know, Staten Islanders were resistant to the colonial, uh, the colonial movement will add uh, tensions. I mean, Washington called Staten Islanders our inveterate enemies. Um, and, um, and so there's going to be a lot of, you know, the, it, 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 the, the tensions will uh, build up as the, as the war uh, progresses. Um, you know, those, uh, when General uh, Charles Lee was assigned to defend New York and, um, he leaves Staten Island undefended. Now, I guess I'll talk more about that a little bit later in our conversation. But um, you know, one of his one of his uh, um, one of his ideas about Staten Island is well, you no, know, maybe we should um, 
confiscate their arms and, um, and you know, their ammunition. And then if that doesn't work to keep them you know, in line, then maybe we should uh, take their children as hostages. Um, and a very radical position for the 18th century. Um, but it goes to show you um, how, lo how loyalist this community was and how concerned the uh, American, you know, uh, officers were about um, that loyalist community. Thank you for that. Um, in, you know, and in the popular understanding of Staten Island, you know, from a cursory reading of this history, we know that Staten Island was largely loyal or had a great loyalist, you know, sort of stronghold. What were some of the motivating reasons why this population was loyal? Was it economic? Was it religious? Was it social? Probably a cocktail of all three and, and then some. Could you illuminate us on that a little bit? It's a, you know, it's a combination of, of all those factors. Um, one of the important factors is that, you know, essentially Staten Island was an Anglican culture hearth. Uh, you know, I mean, the Anglican Church was very, very important to the to the social and political milieu of the island. Um, all of its, just about all of its major political leaders are members of the Anglican Church. Um, it, it's a very deferential society as well as the colonial period, the colonial society was. So and many Staten Islanders deferred to the likes of Christopher Billup uh, when it came to, you know, uh, politics and decisions in politics. Um, the island was also a middle class farming community, um, you know, they're, you know, they're living comfortably. Um, all politics is local, as the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan said. Um, and, um, you know, they were, you know, they weren't feeling any kind of, um, you know, talk about rights and, 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 you know, that's all for, you know, the whole Whitehall and all that. We're making money, we're living our lives, no one's bothering us. Um, so, you know, um, and then, you know, Staten Islanders had also had an experience with the British Army during the French and Indian War. There was a staging area on Staten Island, um, and it was a, a rather good experience with the British uh, forces um, paying in specie for their, for their produce and, and, and firewood. Um, and so, you know, there, there wasn't as much animosity towards the British Empire and the British government on Staten Island as you had in other, other areas of the colonies. For those, for those various factors. Right, but it wasn't, um, it wouldn't be a case of all one or all the other, you know. There certainly was, as you say, a great amount of debate, and certainly we have people on, on both sides, and if you look at the, in the cemeteries of Staten Island, if you go to the Church of St. Andrew, you see Mercero, you see Crocheron, you see the Lateret family, you see a lot of families that are sprinkled across the island, and there's different allegiances for all of them, and so there's a history you can read in the stone there so to speak. Um, I want to shift our focus a little bit to James. Um, I should say that anyone who has not read Dr. Pappas's book, it's an excellent primer in this subject, a wonderful modern take. Yes, there's the plug, uh, that ever loyal island. Um, but also James Verdi's film. Uh, I shared a link to the Vimeo uh, link f f to all the participants tonight. I hope you had a chance to watch it. If you don't, it's a wonderful treatment of the story as well. So these two media converse in a sense. In, in a sense, you have the book and you have the film and Dr. Pappas is in the film. So there's a lot of, there's an echo there. Um, James, what drew you to this subject as a documentary film? And what, what strikes me is how, um, you know, you were able to capture in the film, I don't know if it's drone or I don't know all the technical terms, but you've got some great shots of the natural environment. And it looks as if it's, you know, beautiful Staten Island without any modern contrivance. Yeah. How did you recreate those colonial landscapes in your film? Sure, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So so the, the idea for the film really came about from an earlier project that I was anticipating to be working on. So all the films I've done to, to this point have been helped funded by the uh, SI Arts Grant Association on Staten Island. And at the time, I was planning on doing a few short films on Staten Island waterfront locations. One of those was going to be the conference house, one of those was the ship graveyard, and the other one was the Sagan Mansion. Both phenomenal places. Um, but at the time, I didn't, I didn't really have enough time, really, to finish the, the, the conference house film. So it led me on this sort of path of researching more about the conference house. Initially, the film was going to be about the house, about the famous meeting on, um, on September 11th, and really just going over that sort of small snippet of Staten Island history. 
Um, but as I was researching and I came across Professor Pappas's book, I realized there's a much larger story here outside of just the house and the meeting, but really discussing Staten Island and an overall view um, and how the island itself helped shape the American Revolutionary War. Um, so from that standpoint, the book sort of opened my eyes to, and for myself, it was a real educational experience um, and allowed me to tell the larger story of the island. And it's a story um, I'm 26. It's a story that I wasn't very familiar with growing up, growing up in Staten Island all my life. Um, you know, you sort of know the idea that during the during the, the meeting, you had Benjamin Franklin and John Adams um, and 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 uh, Richard Howe, but you, it sort of stopped there, right? You sort of knew that story, but there was such a, a rich story of the island being um, a real home base for the British and the loyalist activity here. So it really came about from that from that perspective. Um, with regards to sort of like the filming um, of the actual documentary itself, one thing I think the island has done very well is preserving our natural landscape and preserving as much as we can the historical sites that are on the island. So, you know, almost all the film um, footage, uh, apart from one, apart from one clip, is actually Staten Island. Everything else, um, all of it, all of it's Staten Island. And and one thing you you know you'll find if you're from here or you or you visit here is that the, the natural landscape is something we very well preserved. With a borough of parks, we have a we have a, a lot of forests, natural forests, uh, state forests, marshlands. Um, so a lot of the nature shots I got was filmed with a, a drone. It's a little, uh, little handheld camera that flies up in the air and allows me to really get a great view of the landscape as it may have looked like in 1776. Um, and then from really the, the historical aspect of, of the buildings and the sites, I mean, obviously one of the major areas of the film that I use was historic Richmond Town. I don't think there's a better area on Staten Island that has the assortment of colonial homes um, and atmosphere um, than, than Richmond Town, but when you look at the Conference House and the Conference House Park and Fort Wildsworth, um, just to name a few, there's definitely a lot of locations that allowed me to crop out the cars and, and crop out the people in normal street clothes and allow us to sort of view the landscape as it would have looked um, back then. It's really quite incredible. If you think about New York City history, um, if you look at Manhattan, Whitehall, downtown, where a lot of, you know, tumultuous moments took place, that history is obliterated by modern development. Cities like Philadelphia and Boston perhaps do a better job at preserving that just by the nature of how they grew um, after the, the American founding. But New York is sort of, you know, ever expanding and erasing part of its history. But thank goodness for the green belt. Thank goodness for the, the nature of Staten Island uh, as a, the built environment because it really lends itself um, to this, uh, which I think is um, really fascinating. Um, certainly, I, I think we have a whole separate subject of your uh, ship graveyard film that, yeah. I, uh, that I would like to unpack uh, at, a, at another time. Um, I want to give a question to Michael since he's been standing at attention the entire time. Um, Michael, I am interested a little bit in hearing from you because as we understand, you interpret both sides of the conflict wearing the, the, the kit of the British soldier and the uh, American continental alike. So do you get different reactions from the public when you're presenting one side or the other? I wonder if you might help us understand, you know, those divided loyalties as played out in living history presentations. One of the funny things that happens, especially when I'm dressed this way at the conference house, many times people approach me, Mr. Washington, and most people don't understand the different colors and variations of uniforms from both armies, even the Continental Army. Uh, New York, for instance, had about three to four different color uniforms. Everybody's not wearing the iconic blue and red facing coat. And the same goes to the British Army. Not everybody in the British Army is wearing red. How many times I'm dressed as a British soldier and I have an individual come to me and say, you're Confederate, right? I'm like, oh, it's the wrong century. So I get a lot of different reactions from things like that all the time. But uh, even wearing a red coat sometimes, dressed as a British general, people tell me, you're General Washington. I'm like, uh, no, I'm wearing a red, I'm wearing a red coat. I'm not wearing blue. <laughs> So it's an interesting uh, dynamic in terms of what's remembered and what's yes. forgotten. Um, when you do your presentations, do you focus mainly on first person? That is, you state your name uh, as George Washington or do you do more third person? I imagine it depends on if you're 
working in the museum or working at a right. living history event? I uh, like to float back and forth. I like to stay in first person. Uh, say if I'm at the New York Historical Society, somebody will come up to me and ask me who I am. So I'll throw hints at them. I will tell them when I was born as Mr. Washington, and I'm not gonna give the modern calendar, I'm gonna give the old style calendar, which Washington actually celebrated late into his 60s. He was celebrating February 11th, because when he was born, Great Britain was still using the old style calendar. So it would be February 11, 1731. And people look at me puzzled and they're still trying to figure out who I am. And then I keep going on, well, I was born in Pope's Creek Plantation. And then finally they get it, Virginia. And then finally when I get to the part of Mount Vernon, that's when they totally figure it out by then. That's fantastic. Um... I've had my fair share of run-ins with uh, historical figures, either on as a participant or uh, sure. as a reenactor, and it's always um, it's always a fun exchange. Um, yes, it is. We have we have a question from the audience, and uh, I am delighted to share it with you. Um, so we have a question: um, Can you expand on how the revolution affected women? We're all men here, but yes, women are part of the story. Were the women particularly vulnerable to so many soldiers stationed here? Were there any women's leadership either for or against the British? It's an interesting question. I wonder if anybody would like to take a stab at it. I'll try. I'll try to uh, take a uh, take that question. Um, women were in a particularly vulnerable situation on Staten Island during the occupation. Um, women um, faced um, physical violence, physical intimidation, rape on Staten Island, sometimes British officers from the British uh, military, from the Hessian troops that were here. Um, uh, some uh, British officers sort of um, ignored um, the uh, 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 accusations of rape against, uh, against the soldiers. Um, also, as far as, um, as far as women and um, an active role, um, there was um, a young woman on the South Shore uh, her last name was Jackson, who ran a mill for, um, for her husband who had been uh, detained by the British. He had been um, a, a Patriot supporter. And um, she would um, send messages across to the Patriots from Staten Island to tell them about troop movements. And what she would do is she would start the, the mill going and she would send notes uh, across the uh, Kill Van Cull uh, via a slave, one of her slaves, and um, he would row across the Kill Van Cull and drop messages off on the other side um, about troop movements and what, what may be occurring on the island. Um, also, of course, there's Anne Perrine, the Anne, uh, Anne Perrine story where um, she stands up to a British soldier who uh, had, had gone into her house to get some water and he notices that she has some, what look like very expensive buckles on her shoes uh, and um, come, come, decides to come back the next, you know, the, that, that night, and she uh, switches the buckles, right, for, you know, and hides the, the, the silver buckles that she had um, and stands up to him. Um, also, um, the young woman who ran the mill, um, she also would um, uh, talk, you know, stand up to the British officers and British soldiers who were in the area, and many times, one, uh, there's one particular a story where they tell her to fetch a bucket. Uh, an officer, British officer, tells her to fetch a bucket of water so he can clean his feet, uh, and she, you know, she re adamantly refuses to do so. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a form of resistance right there, uh, obviously, to um, to the oc occupying forces. Um, I mean, in a more sort of general sense, um, women were uh, camp followers. Women served as, you know, like, as in nursing, like nurses, we would say. Um, also, um, um, there was, you know, the Molly Pitcher, right? The women who, um, you know, with, with the, I mean, it's sort of a composite of a large group of women. Uh, Mary Ludwig Hayes is the sort of Molly Pitcher of, of, of American Revolution fame. Um, so uh, there's Deborah Sampson, who dressed as a man to fight in the, in the army. Um, and so there's, I mean, there's, you know, women play an active role, even before the American Revolution. Uh, women were very important to um, the boycotts and uh, against British products. Um, you know, women really were the, the, the linchpin, the, the key uh, co colonists in making, the, making that economic coercion work. 
uh, those different boycotts against British products before the, before the war started. So, um, you know, women, you know, it's sometimes in the also traditional interpretation of American, of the American Revolution, it sort of seemed like, um, you know, when the war started, all the women were loaded onto a rocket ship and shot up to Mars somewhere or the moon, and that there was no women involved in the American Revolution. Um, but um, with the new social history that uh, came out in the, in the 60s and early 70s, you know, women have been integrated more and more into the story. Um, and I mean, there's still some work to be, do to be done there, but um, you certainly see women and their experiences in the American Revolution uh, more and more in the histories today. Thank you for that, Dr. Peppers. Yeah, Molly Pitcher certainly came to mind, um, sort of a larger than life figure, um, you know, with the Battle of Monmouth. Um, but I also know that in the reenactor hobby in the community, there's a fair amount of gentle ladies who um, will join and fall in with the units, sometimes paying homage to women who dressed as men or just they want to be a part of the action. Um, I wonder if Michael, you can speak to speak to that phenomenon. Sure. Um, as portrayed an officer, I may have a, what my wife accompany me. I may not. She may like say, for instance, if I'm a British officer, my wife's back home in England. Uh, women, as we're discussing right now, a lot of different roles. Even in the reenactment community, you have gentle women who show up. You have women in the trades running a shop called the Sutlery. Uh, there's women who actually do portray Deborah Sampson. There's this young actress out of uh, Massachusetts who's been doing a wonderful job the last couple of years, really bringing her to life. Uh, my wife, for instance, doesn't just portray Martha Washington. She shows up portraying sometimes Spy 355. 355, the culprit spy ring. They were women in the spy ring. Some people now think it might have been Elizabeth Bergen of Brooklyn who saved about 200 men on the HMS Jersey, helped them escape. So you have a, a lot of different roles. You have women portraying uh, surgeon's mates, helping out the surgeons. You have uh, women uh, nursing men back to health and sometimes uh, doing laundry demonstrations, showing the different lives. And of course, when there's women, you're going to find women, uh, children in camp as well. My two children have been uh, reenacting since they've been three weeks old. My daughter now is going to be 24. My son's uh, 13. So it's a, fa it's a family affair, for sure. Yes, it can be. Yes, absolutely. So we're, thank you, thank you, Lori, for your great question from the audience. And this kind of brings us to an interesting turn in the conversation about social history. Certainly the book Founding Mothers comes to mind with this idea of opening up the book in terms of the record and bringing to light a more inclusive history. Um, one such history that emerges from Dr. Pappas's book, That Ever Loyal Island, is the story of Colonel Ty, who was a man who was enslaved and uh, self-emancipated himself and became a part of the British forces, uh, fighting in raids and battles uh, throughout New Jersey. Um, Dr. Pappas, and I'll pose this question to, to James as well, since Colonel Ty is addressed in both the documentary film and the book. Um, Dr. Pappas, can you tell us about the challenges of bringing this history to light with all we talk about with privilege and the nature of the historical record? Um, and then James, you can maybe comment on what it was like to incorporate that story into the film. Um, sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll address that issue. Again, um, in the traditional histories of the American Revolution, um, like women, African Americans uh, very rarely uh, showed up in those histories. Um, when you when you when you specifically look at Colonel Ty, um, Colonel Ty will take advantage of a British policy implemented by Lord Dunmore, who was the Royal Governor of Virginia, and um, um, recruited an, Afri uh, an African American regiment. Dunmore's proclamation um, issued in, in 1775 um, essentially stated that if you were an enslaved person of someone who supported the resistance movement and you were able to escape that enslavement and join the British military in putting down the rebellion, you'd be guaranteed your freedom. Um, this policy only um, applied to uh, enslaved persons of patriot masters, not of loyalists. 
Um, so on the island um, where you had, you know, many loyalists who were slave, uh, slave owners and slavery was a very important part of the economy of all of the colonies and of the British Empire. I mean, many, uh, not just planters, but merchants in the British monarchy made money uh, from that system. Um, but also uh, it was an important part of the local economy uh, in Staten Island. Um, there was, uh, you know, it was about uh, a third of the people enslaved. Um, and, um, you know, if, if, you look at, if you look at the numbers, um, at, at, after, at the end of the war, there's about 3,800 or so Staten Islanders, people living on Staten Island here. Um, uh, 886 are African Americans. Uh, 740 are enslaved African Americans of the 886. Um, so um, slavery played a, a, a very um, important role in the economy and in the social structure of Staten Island like it did in all the other colonies uh, and communities throughout the colonies. Um, but in particular with Colonel Ty, um, Colonel Ty will, was uh, born in uh, Coltsneck, New Jersey um, and was enslaved in, in, Col in a farm in Coltsneck um, had heard about this proclamation when the British Army was on Staten Island, took advantage of it, um, came across to kill Van Cull and joined the British, uh, the British military. And he led um, sort of like a partisan group that would go back into New Jersey and scout the area for the British, uh, forage, um, also take patriots, uh, kidnap patriots, um, raid certain patriot farms. Um, and he gained a reputation throughout, especially Monmouth County um, uh, and, his, and his partisan group. Um, eventually, um, the uh, Monmouth County Patriots established what is called the Retaliators uh, as a way to combat partisan groups, loyalist groups coming from Staten Island, and one of them was his group. Um, and uh, the leader of those Retaliators was a guy named Joshua Huddy, uh, who was known to be very ruthless towards uh, loyalists. Um, and... Um, uh, in a gun, in a skirmish between Colonel Ty's uh, partisan group and uh, the retaliators in 7 September of 1780, Colonel Ty was um, wounded in the wrist um, and died several days later from tetanus. Um, but, you know, the, the, the title Colonel um, is a ceremonial title that was given to him by the British military because of his um, exploits on the battlefield during the Battle of Monmouth. Um, and African American. Um, loyalists um, who supported the British military here in the island were utilized as foragers, as scouts, as um, you know, supply detail, um, setting up encampments, um, and um, an important part of um, the um, you know the British military experience uh, on Staten Island. And um, you know, if I can just flash forward to the end of the war uh, for a minute or two. Um, Many of those uh, African American loyalists were not given their freedom. Um, many African American loyalists who evacuated from the New York area in 1783 ended up in Canada, um, well, Birchtown, uh, up in up in Canada, a very important uh, 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 historic site when it comes to uh, the African loyalist diaspora. Um, faced hardship there, faced racism. Uh, um, from former white and you know, white loyalists, um, and will play a role in the formation of uh, Sierra Leone uh, in West Africa. Um, slave, uh, former uh, African American loyalists from the South who evacuated to places like Jamaica, in many cases, were sold back into slavery. Um, and so, um, you know, if the Dunmore's policy and the proclamation adopted by the British military was a policy of, of military expediency. Um, it was a policy that we need manpower here. And so, um, you know, we're going to use as much manpower as it can. And it's also trying to weaken the colonial economy, which, as I mentioned, was very much, very much tied. Slavery was tied into that economy. Yeah, and just from the, from the, from the film perspective, I mean, obviously, when you're, when you're trying to tell a, a story of, of seven years over the course of 40 minutes, um, there's a lot of elements that go into, you know, developing a cohesive story. But you know, after reading uh, Professor Pappas' book and doing research through, through uh, reading letters and, and reading diaries, which is one of my, my major um, focuses for, for research, um, diaries of people who were on the island at the time, most of them were Hessian soldiers or British soldiers. 
Um, one of the things that shocked me was just how large of a slave population Staten Island had. I mean, you know, Professor Pappas mentioned a third of the island was was um, were enslaved African Americans. So it was obviously a critical piece of of the Staten Island history as pertaining to the war. And what also caught me fascinating was Dunmore's proclamation, as he just as he just spoke about, and really, you know, not the good natured. Um, proclamation you would think of, of freeing these enslaved African Americans, but really a, a very selfish um, act to disrupt uh, patriot socioeconomic structure and also and also gain more manpower. So when when looking at Colonel Ty, he was obviously a major um, figure um, from the loyalist perspective, which is what I was focusing on um, for the Staten Island based narrative. And you know, through some research, I'm able to find it's in the film, which is which is pretty neat. It's a it's an advertisement or really a newspaper clipping from the from the slave owner who had formerly owned Colonel Ty, um, asking for his return, um, which was a, which was a fascinating uh, piece of history. And just just the idea that um, you had you know you had an African American loyalist who was very prevalent on on Staten Island, um, and and it turns out was was born in Colts Neck, and I believe. He also also died in Colts Neck, which is not too far away from where, where I am now in, um, in New Jersey. Uh, but, you know, it's it was certainly an important narrative given the entire the slave population on Staten Island. So I think between, you know, explaining that during the film of how important slavery was towards the, the socioeconomic structure and how that helped form the loyalist narrative on Staten Island to, to players like Colonel Ty, who came over because of, of Dunmore's proclamation and sort of found a home in this area um, was certainly a, a, an important narrative to be, to be told. Thank you so much. Um, the political self-interest on the part of the British rings true in this analysis to me when you think about the fact that there were some machinations of the British 80 years later or so during the Civil War. You know, they were supporting the Confederate cause in the hopes that, uh, for their self-interest, in the hopes that that would, that would change their calculation with their trade with the South versus the North. There's two countries, you know, one's weaker than the other. Um, so yeah, it's not an enlightened perspective per se, but a self-interested one in terms of the, in terms of the country itself. Um, this is an interesting conversation. And getting back to the idea of living history and representation, um, in my understanding, um, the bicentennial, 1970s, is really when, you know, this modern interest in American history is at its apex. Um, and as far as the hobby of living history, um, when it's, it really comes to bear. And I wonder if Michael could comment on that. And if, you know, going from the 1970s to today, um, are there more reenactors of color today? Is that story being told in living history today in a way that's more inclusive than it would have been perhaps in the 1970s or even the 1990s? I would say there is more now. Uh, I've been doing this um, for about 23, 24 years now. And over the 24 years, I've seen it evolve more and more. I would say one of the most impeccable dressed gentlemen I know who portrays a continental soldier, he portrays a militia officer, he portrays a Pennsylvania officer, he's an African American. And he has a down pat, he has the clothing, he has the mannerism, and he's very proud of his history. He's the gentleman that uh, I took interest in changing some of my hairstyles. One of the three wigs I have, I saw him with the wig I have on. I asked, well, where did you get that? Did you get it from this sutler rate? Okay, good. I know if you're wearing it, I know it's a reputable uh, sutler and I know it looks great on you. Hopefully it works for me. There's a, a young woman, she works out of the New York Historical Society and she, does, she uh, runs a company called Not Your Mama's History. Uh, she does a wonderful job at her presentations as well. And she's been slowly actually showing up to reenactments, not just doing it professionally as well. So, uh, I've been seeing, uh, since I started, there's this gentleman that's been portrayed a member of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. I believe he's still around. I, I haven't seen him in a long time. There's a group of gentlemen that, uh, out of Trenton that I see them a lot also out on the battlefield. So you're seeing more and more showing up and even you see uh, people portraying Native Americans more as well not just somebody who uh, in the 1970s it looks like something out of a TV show called F True it's like now they're seriously doing their research they're seriously 
dressing, the way it was documented. We have more documentation now. You have people of all walks of life, all, di all different nations that were involved in what you could say is a civil war. That's excellent. Um, I believe you're referring to Cheney McKnight, who works at- Correct. Absolutely. Shout out to Cheney. She's done some great work at Historic Richmond Town yes. in years past. Absolutely. Um, this is a very, uh, it's a, a vast community, but it's one that's also very small. The museum yes, was is. small, but living history too. So you're falling in with the, the same kinds of folks that, um, that we're talking about here. Um, so uh, this is a fascinating, uh, as I keep saying, fascinating conversation. Um, yes. So I spoke about the bicentennial. Um, and I, I think I mentioned this to you earlier when we were first chatting about this. And this is a question for all three of you, uh, just a sort of crystal ball moment. Um, looking back at the Bicentennial, the argument can be made that the histories that were upheld in that time were a reflection of the mores and the customs of that time in that it was a largely, you know, white privileged uh, Eurocentric story that was being told. Uh, so, in the moment in which we now live, uh, in the midst of the political rancor, um, in the midst of the calls for social justice in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and all of the crescendo of politics, um, what work lies ahead in the commemoration of the semi-quicentennial 250th anniversary of the United States in 2026? Big question. Um, I mean, I think, I think, I hope it's a more inclusive narrative, um, more inclusive of women, African Americans, Native Americans. Uh, there is, there is more work now being done on Native Americans and, and, and the war. Um, I like to see, you know, uh, a little bit more done on that. Um, also, I think, um, you know, European ethnicities other than British and British Isles, um, you know, um, you know uh, Italians who may have been in, in, the, in, the, in the Continental Army, uh, Greeks who may have been in the, in the Continental Army. Um, I think we need to start looking at that a little bit, a little bit more. Um, obviously, the numbers aren't that big, but still, it's part of the, it's part of the story. Um, also, I think, um, I think more work needs to be done on the interaction in what is known as the borderlands uh, between out in the West, you know, between the British territories and, and uh, Spanish territories. Um, so I think more work needs to be done there. And I hope um, by the time we reach um, uh, the next celebration of the American Revolution, that that is incorporated more into the interpretation as well. Um, uh, I think more local history needs to be done. Um, I'm a big proponent of, of looking at the bigger picture through the lens of local history. Um, you can learn a lot that way. You can certainly learn a lot about the everyday person that way. Um, and, uh, you know, we sort of, you know, we tend to see the big picture. We tend to see the sort of more national events. Um, but looking at it from a local perspective gives you a little bit more intimacy uh, with, with the war. Um, so I think, I think, more work needs to be done on a local level. Um, I think more academic historians need to embrace local history. Um, you know, it's sort of local history has been sort of frowned upon in, in, in many academic circles. And I think it needs to be brought more into the, the, the larger narrative. I mean, I think we need more, more uh, works like, you know, that Ever Loyal Island. We need more works like um, books about um, German, uh, you know, Pennsylvania Dutch in, in, in the American Revolution, the Moravians in, 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 in North Carolina. Um, you know, we need, we need more of that local flavor um, in, in, in the American Revolutionary narrative. And I hope there's more of that that comes in uh, for the next celebration. Um, and, I, and if I could just add one more thing, um, I also think that, you know, we should look at the founding documents and, and, and look at and sort of connect their meaning to the sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the, re, the racial reality um, of this country. And um, we, sort of, we sort of tend to miss um, a, a lot of the enlighten, enlightenment um, uh, notions behind those documents. 
uh, and we need to sort of explore those documents within this new um, within this within this new reality that we that we are in currently. And you know, um, I, I think that needs to be done as well. I think we need to rethink those documents uh, to be more inclusive. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I'll touch just briefly. Professor Pappas basically basically had had a had a perfect answer, but I, I do want to touch on just briefly the, the piece about local history. Um, you know that that was something that was really important to me. Um, most of the films I've done to date have been about Staten Island. It's I've lived uh, up until very recently. I've lived there all my life, um, and I grew up there. And it was it, it was a place that. Um, often gets frowned upon from, from people that don't necessarily live on the island. Um, but it, for people that do live on the island, it's also not widely known about the history of the island. And even, you know, leaving, leaving the American Revolutionary War, I mean, there's other aspects historically and culturally on the island that just aren't known about. So I think one of the areas we need to start is just doing a better job of, of teaching local history, um, whether it be, as, as, as Professor Papp has mentioned, through books or, or, or other mediums, um, just to allow people to understand where it is they live and what happened before they were there um, can help us guide us in the future to, to, you know, obviously where we want to go. Um, so I think a more focus on local history really is a critical piece um, to, to this whole puzzle. And um, if there's one thing I've learned from this entire experience, um, from making this film and making the other films about Staten Island is there's a huge world out there right out of your front door. You don't have to travel far um, to really find an amazing story um, that, that, that is worth telling. So, um, you know, you can write a million books on, on George Washington and there have been um, or, or any other subject that's widely known about. Um, but it's, it's really the, it's the small pieces, um, the local history that can really get into the nitty gritty and explain why things happen, um, what led to the larger events. And, and, and that's really, you know, a big culmination of it. Yeah, I'd say absolutely. You're, you're speaking to the choir here. Both, uh, both gentlemen, perfect. You know, one of the things that I've been doing for the last 20 years uh, when I'm portraying a soldier during the American Revolution is talking about what happened in the backyard, what happened in your hometown, what happened in New York City in general. Most people don't focus on New York City during the revolution. They totally ignore it. It's all Boston, it's all Philadelphia, it's all Charleston down in South Carolina, it's all down in Virginia. No, we have it in our backyard. You just have to know where to find it. One of the, the tools I love to use is I have a whole cadre of 18th century maps that I use. 18th century maps of New York. What was here? What was on this site 200 years ago, 250 years ago? Who lived here? What peoples lived here in this area? You know, learn about the history, learn about it. Yes, the American Revolution is important to New York City. Unfortunately, as we discussed before, a lot of it just dwindled away and it's gone. But if you go to Lower Manhattan, you look at all those street names, 99% of all those street names are the original street names and the original grid from this time period. So we are surrounded by the history and it is important. How did New York City get here? How do we get certain things? How did these neighborhoods get these names? It's all important right here. When I, one of the things I love to do when I portray Washington and the New York area, I'm not talking about Virginia. I'm not talking about in Philadelphia. I'm talking about my visits to New York City. I'm talking about where I've been. Why was I here? Why was I in Westchester County? A good friend of mine happens to be the town of Story in the village I live in in East Chester, uh, up here in Westchester County. And he's w working up for the 250 as well, and I've been helping him too. Uh, uh, working on the different peoples that were involved. There was some African Americans in this town. Nobody thinks about that during the time of the American Revolution. Not everybody was a patriot. Not about everybody was siding with the Continental Congress. They were loyalists here. There were families here, names that people that still live here in this town. It's all important, our local history. Very well said, gentlemen. Thank you. It's sort of we're in that we're in that like political program where we all agree with each other, and uh, and there's lots of uh, comity among all of us. Um, it occurs to me that the reenactor community is gearing up as they have been for decades. You know, live you know sort of awaiting these anniversaries with great expectation. Museums, scholars, filmmakers, all are a part of that conversation, and we're talking about public history. We're talking about how history is communicated to the public, how they grapple with history, how they understand it. Uh, we have to meet people where they are. 
Um, and that's what Historic Richmond Town is committed to. And that's what I think we all are committed to in this call in certain ways. So it'll be, it's interesting because each of these anniversaries is a reflection of the moment in which it occurs. Um, sometimes those anniversaries sync up with a national conversation that 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 brings discourse forward. Sometimes anniversaries happen in a moment where the public is rather disinterested. Um, and so it's interesting as humans, as we sort of count the arbitrary years that have followed uh, in our own invented calendar that we tend to think of history in this way. Um, I wanna sort of bring us to a close uh, in a few minutes. And I wanna pose a question that uh, I'm very interested in. Um, uh, in my in my museum work, I've done a fair amount of myth busting. It's actually one of my favorite things to do in museums. When people bring with them to their visit a idea or something they know to be true. For example, the most basic one I can think of is if people are in a salt box house with a short kitchen roof or ceiling, they'll say, don't you see, darling, people were shorter back then. And they go on thinking that is the case. I'm wondering if we can identify together any of the commonly held myths about the American Revolution that persist to this day. Maybe one that you just uh, got busted for yourself or one that you hear time and time again. I mean, I'll, I'll go because my, mine's probably mine's probably the most rudimentary. Um, I, I have two. So the first one, Michael actually touched on briefly, but the idea that everybody during the war was a patriot. Um, you know, we sort of think, I'll type my lens. I sort of thought that it was really the patriots versus the British, but really it's, it's the patriots against the British and the loyalists. And you know, there's kind of debate about what the population and what, what the percentage numbers of uh, were versus loyalists and patriots and who was undecided. You know, from my research, I mean, you, and, and the experts may, may have a different answer, but, you know, I've heard it's, it's 30 percent, uh, 33 percent patriot, 33 percent loyalist, 33 percent not decided, 20 percent, you know. But the, the idea is there's a large percentage of people that were not for the cause. Um, or we're just impartial. So when we think about the war on, at a larger level, it's it's as, as, as Professor Mavis mentioned, it's a silver war. It's a civil war because we're, it's, it's brother against brother. Um, and it's not as simple as everyone in, in America at that time was patriot fighting the British forces. They were also, you know, fighting, fighting their neighbors. Um, and the second, I have two. So the second one goes back to what I've learned during my research was the, the sort of guerrilla style warfare that was very prevalent, at least, at least in Staten Island and, 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 and New Jersey, the bordering areas of New Jersey. You know, from my, from my perspective, I, I always thought tactics at that time were, were larger scale warfare, Battle of Bunker, Battle, Battle of Bunker Hill, um, Lexington and Concord, Battle of Brooklyn, larger sort of skirmishes um, that really led to the majority of the fighting. And while that may be true, um, I think there's a large percentage that, that were real style and, and very, run, you know, run and gun, um, down and dirty. Uh, and, and, and during the film and in, in Pappas' book, that plays a huge factor in, in sort of the, the British psyche at the time on Staten Island, sort of not, not really understanding this type of warfare and, 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 and kind of going a little bit, a little bit store crazy because they're, they were sort of used to the more regimented style. Um, so those are two things that I sort of learned through the research that going in, I had believed one coming out, I found out it wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah, I, um, that was actually, it's one of, that's also one of mine as well, James, the idea that we we're all, you know, everybody was a patriot, uh, in, in America and, uh, you know, everybody was rah-rah for the patriot cause. Um, but you know, there's a lot of gray area there. Um, as, and as, as James mentioned, um, I, I sort of, uh, uh, another sort of myth that I often hear about is, uh, did George Washington, uh, traversed Staten Island and he was on Staten Island and, and, you know, um, made his way onto Staten Island during the war and, um, you know, met up with some of the spies on Staten Island during the war and, you know, um, obviously I don't think, uh, loyal, uh, British occupied Staten Island would have been a good place. Uh, for George Washington to be. Um, and so I, I often hear that as well, that he was here, you know, he went, you know, uh, he went across Staten Island, he met with spies here on Staten Island. And, and um, that's sort of one of the, the myths I've come across. Um, 
here on here on the island. Michael, you're up for any myths if you got them on tap. Let's see. Um, one of the things the public likes to, 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 to say all the time when they visit us that uh, the war was won by the militia units. Well, not really. Uh, early on in the war, 1776, uh, Washington did not care much for the way they behaved, especially at Long Island, and especially uh, the day before the Battle of Harlem Heights. Uh, it wasn't probably till von Steuben arrived in uh, North America and he came into camp and he started to train the Americans to fight like a regular standard British, uh, British army, fighting like European army, linear tactics, which we were fighting linear tactics in the American Civil War 90 years later on. And when the Americans started to fight, you have the Battle of Monmouth, and that was the first battle right out of Valley Forge. And that pretty much was a stalemate, really, although the historians say, well, the British won that one. Yeah, well, it could have gone either way because they're really fighting out there in the field. They're fighting like a European-style army. And I, that's probably one, one of the times the British probably realized, well, this isn't going to be easy and this is going to drag on even more. Maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, Sir Richard Howe uh, decided to uh, resign his commission and go back to London. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of myths out there. You know, one of the big ones with George Washington, of course, has always been the wooden teeth. Well, no, they were made out of cast teeth, hippopotamus tusks. Some of them might have been teeth that came from the, his enslaved population on his plantation. We don't know, but that's where the teeth came from. They're not made out of wood. Or you have all these other myths about the American Revolution. Uh, let's see. One of the ones that uh, I found out about uh, at a very young age was the dollar being thrown across the Potomac River. I'm like, well, you can't really throw a dollar across the Potomac River unless maybe you're all the way in the northern region of Maryland. I know there's this area that I've been to personally, but I doubt it happened. Uh, but there's a lot of things, a lot of things we have to try to correct through, uh, through research. You know, uh, the other thing is everybody's wearing a red coat. As I said before, everybody's wearing a blue coat. Well, British Royal Navy is wearing blue. I'm a naval officer. I'm wearing blue. The Royal Artillery wears blue. Bannister Talton, he's an, a, a loyalist commanding an American unit. The, uh, the, uh, the Royal American uh, Legion, they're wearing green coats. So not everybody is wearing the same coat. And then you, when you throw the Hessians in, you're dealing with their green coats as well. You're dealing with their blue coats. Then you deal with the French wearing white coats. It's like, no, it's not black and white. There's all the different colors in between that's going on here. That's a great point. Often the answer to the question or the, 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 the anti-myth answer is more complicated than the, the question or the myth, right? And I think sometimes we have an aversion to that nuance because we want answers to be cut and dry. We want the forces to be red or blue. You know, we want it to, right. be, we want it to fit into a script. Um, I have a question uh, and it might be, it might be in, in um, Professor Pappas's wheelhouse. When we talk about the occupation of Staten Island, uh, depending on what you read and the resources you look at, we have an understanding that more than 20,000, 20 to 30,000 troops are coming to the island in in these waves, uh, sort of this this you know this are this the, all these ships coming into the narrows, um, but we know that the population of Staten Island was like a tenth of that, around three thousand people, if I'm not mistaken, at the time. Um, how many of those thirty thousand troops did they all linger here for a long time? Like, what was the average number of troops like on the island? Of course, I understand it was probably pretty variant, but. Um, it doesn't seem possible for 30,000 troops to be quartered on the island with a population of 3,000. So the, the 30, you know, about 32,000 are here, let's say on the eve of the Battle of, uh, you know, Battle of Brooklyn. Um, the first wave, um, about 9,000 troops, and they uh, finally come ashore. The last of those 9,000 troops come ashore on July 4th as we're proclaiming our independence. Um, and then by early to mid August, you've got about 32,000. 
with about 450 warships out on the, in, in the bay. Um, right before the Battle of Brooklyn, um, the, Howe, the Howe brothers uh, decide to move the troops to Gravesend from here. Um, so the bulk of the troops leave. Um, however, Staten Island is still occupied as a garrison with uh, a few thousand troops um, and a place where um, convalescents, uh, could, you know, wounded can be brought here. Um, also, um, staging areas for, you know, for any kind of uh, other operations in the area. Um, so the bulk of that 32,000 are off the island by, let's say, late August of 1776. But there is uh, substantial numbers and it's different, the numbers, like you said, the numbers are different at different times. Um, also, those numbers are enhanced by loyalist uh, units uh, at, at any given time on Staten Island. So it's still occupied as a garrison. It's seen as a, a geographic linchpin to the area. Um, and so the British want to hold it. Um, you, know, you control the Narrows. You can launch uh, attacks you know, up the Hudson into Manhattan, right, into Long Island and into Jersey. And then you're over into Philadelphia. So, I mean, they keep it as a sort of bulwark against their occupied New York and occupied parts of Long Island. Um, but the, the numbers are vary depending on, you know, what's going on and with the, with the military planning. Um, you know, it's a staging area. It's a place where troops are being you know, convalesced and so on. Um, and then you've got, you've got the loyalist uh, units. You've got the New Jersey volunteers here as one example of a loyalist unit. You've got the Staten Island sort of home guard, right? The, um, the Staten Island Militia, Billups Corps, and the Cavalry, which was commanded by Isaac Decker, uh, Decker's Ferry, Port Richmond, uh, uh, before Port Richmond's Decker's Ferry. Um, so, um, you know, there's a, there's, there's a number of troops here, um, but not as many as the 32,000 out of here, you know, in that, in that expeditionary force in, in the beginning. Right. Obviously, they overwhelmed the, the local population here. I mean, right, and they were very, um, they took up a lot of space, they used a lot of resources, um, and there's this narrative that in the beginning, the British were very res respective and respectful of the population. Um, but of course, as the war dragged on, there's a sense of fatigue and the documentary explains this very nicely as well. And of course, you know, there's a sense of the prolonged conflict. And, uh, you know, we, we have Anne Perrine, who is a loyalist family, and she's saying, hey, they cut down all my trees. You know, so um, it did, they, it was indiscriminate in terms of you know, what resources were needed. I'm glad you touched on Billups uh, Corps, uh, uh, Professor, uh, with a question from the audience from, uh, from Dennis. What about the Billups Corps? Do we have anything on them? Were they their own group? Did they have uniforms? Very, very nuanced question. So they were sort of the local sort of home guard, the local militia. Um, and they, you know, they are their sort of own unit um, and they have a, 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 a unit of cavalry as well, which is, uh, which was commanded by Isaac Decker. Um, so, you know, they were, you know, they're part of the sort of the general sort of loyalist uh, military, you know, history. Um, but they are sort of the, the sort of local, you know, militia to here. Um, as far as the uniforms go, I, I don't know exactly what their uniforms were. I mean, maybe we could toss that question to, to Michael, if he might know what possibly Billups Corps would have been wearing as far as a uniform. I know the recreated Billups Corps, they wear a matter red coat like the British Army coat without any regimental lace on it. And they wear a simple black roundabout hat, kind of almost like a bowler type of hat. Um, and it looks like they're wearing uh, civilian uh, breeches or uh, gaitered trousers or overhauls as they were called and uh, a simple uh, linen uh, waistcoat and uh, shirt. So they might have had some sort of a regimental coat that was supplied to them, but it would have been very, very plain. Wow, there you have it. That was, a, that was not a rehearsed question. That is a live question we got from the audience and we have a very uh, rich answer provided to that. Um, Thank you so much. Um, so I think we're going to move to a close. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to all the folks from home who tuned in. 
Thank you for donating uh, $3 to participate in this program. Thank you for supporting Historic Richmond Town. Um, thank you to Michael Grillo. Thank you to James Verdi. And thank you to Dr. Pappas for the generosity of your time um, in putting this program together. Um, at Historic Richmond Town, we are dedicated to telling a holistic, inclusive story of our history as it plays out here. Um, and it's an interesting topic about Staten Island because um, this was an important place to the wrong side of the conflict, so to speak, in that uh, it, was a, it was a land that was sought out by the British. So I think Staten Island is sometimes overlooked, misunderstood, perhaps to paraphrase what James was talking about before. And I think that history is also part of it. But there is an immense richness to that story. In the historic Richmond Town archives um, here on campus, we have an incredible collection and we have all kinds of artifacts, material uh, related to these families who lived through this conflict and a really complicated um, picture emerges from that. Um, Dr. Pappas notes in his book, the, uh, the research team at Richmond Town, uh, Car uh, Carlotta DeFillo among them, who were so generous with their time in helping him put together um, his book. And so this is also a credit to their work in being the stewards of our collection. Um, so once again, Thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. Good night, Thank all. you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank Good you night, everybody. <laughs>